So I want to cover today section seven, and we'll do units one and two today, and then we'll do uh, unit three tomorrow. If we run a snow day, I already have a um, NIMS grinding one practice test for you guys to take. It's 15 questions, and um, it'll pop up. So if for some reason Thursday turns out to be a snow day, you'll see that populate on Thursday. It'll be good to go. If if not, what we may do with Thursday is just bring it in class and just go over the questions and answers with it. Um, I think a couple of the questions are a little odd and could probably use some explaining. So um, if you guys do that on Thursday for a snow day, Monday will, I think Monday's President's Day, Tuesday, we'll pick it up. We'll answer any kind of questions that you have from those 15 questions. And then Wednesday, you'll take the test. I'm going to give you guys just the 23rd to take the class or to take the test. Everybody's taking that test or a test on that day. So all of our machining students are going to come down and do that, do a test that day. If you fail it, you just need to schedule it up for yourself. There is no additional test day set up. So like normally we might have like the 23rd and the 28th. This time I just did the 23rd. We're good to go for that. And um, we are nearing the end. And um, so let's get started here. And we'll go through, like I said, section seven. Um, and I'm going to pop up just these slides from the screen. Is this what the NIMS is over? Grinding? It, yes, that's what you're doing. NIMS grinding one is what you're doing this semester. If you've been if you've been following your immersive stuff, then um, there's already uh, or actually sorry, there was not a NIMS practice test for grinding, but I just put one in there. It's not an assignment. I'm not scoring you for it. It's an additional thing that you want to do just to help you get practiced up for it. What you don't want to do is just get hit with that wonky question as you go to a NIMS test and be like, oh, that's I'm unsure. Need some clarification on that question. So. Just real quick, real straightforward. Honestly, in grinding, by now you've got enough information built up within your mind of turning and milling and you know just different boring and different things like like this will make sense to you really quick. And so that's really how things go. So like when you go, you said that you guys did some thread milling yesterday at work. So thread milling becomes much easier to understand now as opposed to 101. Like, if I said, hey, go thread mill this, you'd be like, tap it. I'm like, no, thread mill. Well, now you understand circular interpolation and milling threads or making threads. So you combine those two things together. The only thing that probably seemed weird about it is you started at the bottom of the hole and came up. And you're like, why are you doing that? But you have to because it makes left hand threads if you don't. So um, you've already been doing some grinding. You've been, you did a little bit of grinding in 103. You're doing more grinding now. Um, so standard grinding works like what you see here. Cable going back and forth, in and out. Your wheel spins, it goes up and down. That's your Z for it. And so we're going to talk about um, grinding grinders and wheels today. So this is a rotary grinder. So a lot of times you would uh, Blanchard makes a makes a big rotary grinder. They're very kind of um, so it's like saying a crescent wrench, you know, because crescent is a company. So it's kind of like, like, or channel locks, you know, channel lock is a company. So rotary grinders are often called blanket grinders. And so what's happening here is um, the, the table is spinning, the head is spinning, the wheel is spinning. And so it creates this really cool crosshatch pattern. So think about like um, uh, clutch pressure plates, brake rotors where you don't want that spiral on them or anything like that. Um, you want to get this crosshatch on there so that so that it, it grips it rather than digs in and just creates more channel going around it. So it's a disruption in the surface of it. So it's actually why this have this cool pattern on it you're using? Yeah, not just for coolness. Now sometimes, um, so like at the shop, we, I can't grind. We did a lot of ODID grinding and so you can still get that same look when you're grinding apart. So picture a lathe with a big grinding attachment on it. Uh, the wheel comes in and you, you bump the face 
of the grinding wheel um, on the diameter of the part, so the part's spinning, you bring a wheel in there. Uh, it kind of is kind of doing a similar function here, where it's actually you got your wheels, you got your part spinning one way, your wheel spinning two, and it creates that crosshatch, kind of a crosshatch pattern across it. But yeah, so that's not just for a really cool look. Uh, it actually has it has functionality for it. All right, so here's just your down feed, and that can be um, identified in any any number of ways. Uh, a lot of times it's going to be by tints. A lot of times you might put a tint indicator on there. We've got a saddle indicator on ours, and so we're just watching it, you know, just kind of half, half movements inside of there. And so it depends. On, so it could be metric. So you want to make sure if your grinder is metric or standard. A lot of them we're going to see in some of the slides that are digital. So they got digital readout for down feed. Um, our grinders were totally automatic. So they were not CNC grinders, but they were automatic grinders, Okamoto's. And they did the table moved in and out, back and forth, down feed, up and down. It was all automatic. So you just, you say, I want to grind up 20 thousandths of it, and you walk away from it, come back when it was done. And so um, they were slightly different, way bigger than what the grinders that we have. Did those automatically dress the wheel? They didn't, but they have them. They do. Now, if you're automatically dressing the wheel or you're going to move in shape, that's a CNC grinder. So, like, um, OD grinders, ID grinders, and then some of the CNC service grinders are like that. They're going to grind so long, and they generally have fingers that run along. I'm looking for something shaft shape. Um, trying not to sneeze. So, two words with one stone. So, they might have a grinding wheel that's running on the outside of them. Um, so, grinding wheels running on there. The wheel doesn't necessarily know when it needs to be dressed. You might tell it at a certain point it needs to be dressed. It's got these fingers that come down on it, and it'll tell the diameter of it. And so, it'll say, oh, hey, we're starting to get some taper, and it might dress, or uh, it'll, just, it'll just run it down until it gets to the size. So, you know, that way the grinding wheel knows how it's gotten to the right size. So, over Garden Denver, they do a ton of OD grinding. <laughs> and that's how they do it. They put those fingers on there. Grinding wheel goes down to where it needs to and hits the right diameter or comes out to the right diameter and you're good to go. You don't necessarily have to dress it as long as it gets the right size from flip switch. Um, yeah, so... Good question. So when when you're dressing, the thing that you dress trying to dress out of it, see how that one's all shiny? Mm -hmm. So it's a glaze. So if you got glaze or, or load, trying to get that wheel to look back like that. That's typically now you might have something that you grind all day long and don't need to dress. Pretty uncommon. But um, depending on the wheel configuration and the part that you're doing, you're not dressing necessarily a certain interval as you are when it, when it is needed. So same thing about changing an insert. I mean, you know inserts have a certain lifespan, 15 minutes in the cut, but 15 minutes in the cut could be six hours or could actually be 15 minutes, depending on how long it's actually in the cut. So um, so those things, those things play into it. All right, you got your wheel guard, you got your grinding wheel. Um, and this matters for how much you can uh, shoulder grind. Here's one. This is what this is Chevalier, and uh, this is similar to what I'm looking at getting in the future. Now, what's why I've been kind of hesitant to buy a ton of service grinders is that um, or OD ID grinders is like I think Makino sells an OD ID grinding attachment on their CNC machines, so you can grind right there on the machine. Now, generally speaking, I wouldn't want to do it on a normal CNC because it's so abrasive. And then, I mean, you really got to pay attention to cleaning it out because what happens is that gets down under the ways, dig, I mean, it's like pouring sandblaster sand inside of it. And so you want to ruin a machine pretty fast, that's how you do it. But this one, um, full digital readout, probably full CNC, so it can do any kind of programmable movements that you want.
All right, so here's just our x-axis feed, our y-axis feed. Here's a, just a, another uh, form of rotating on the grinding wheel. Get a uh, kind of spiral look across the top of it. Rotor grinding. Here's a um, here's a wheel that's used on a rotary grinder. Um, not all of them look like that. A lot of them, like the ones that we had, were like wheel chunks. So there were like four, four or five pieces that went up inside of there. So they were separated. Um, so the, the table on our grinder was about like this and spun. And, and so this one was just a single one. It goes up into an arbor. The arbor expands and holds it in there. Here's ID grinding. So all you guys have done up to this point service grinding, but internal grinding. Um, so very similar to a lathe. Uh, if you notice those are grinding on the opposite side, it's, it's pretty common. Um, this is spinning. These things spin at insanely fast RPM. So run out becomes really important. Now this is probably only spinning about 200 RPM. This is probably about 12,000 RPM. So um, how how true it runs matters. So that's when we talk about wheel balancing. Um, and then um, whether it's wet or dry matters. Because I've told you guys before, like when, when we ground with coolant, we let the wheel, the wheel run all day long. Because what happens is if you shut the wheel off and you're running coolant, all that coolant soaks down to the bottom of the wheel. Now imagine you hit the button, you turn this thing on at 10, 20,000 RPM, and that's a great way for wheels to break. I mean, the guy who originally owned our shop had a big, uh, still has, a big giant scar in his arm where that something similar to that happened. He was ID grinding. He's actually tool post grinding. And the wheel exploded. Half of it went to his arm. The other half of it went out the roof and landed in the parking lot. And um, so it can, I mean, it, and it's one of those things that, like, you can't even turn your head fast enough to avoid it. You just got to hope that you're not in the flight line of, or the flight path of what's going on. So ID grinding, um, and, and again, these are available on CNC lathes as well. So in and out, and then just continue to come out to the diameter. The thing that I think about grinding anymore is, um, here's just grinding on the OD, the outside of it. So the part's spinning, the wheel's spinning, and grinding the OD on it. Turning has gotten, we've gotten so good at hard turning, you just see less and less grinding. Like, unless you need good flat surfaces, even really good shell mills can mill almost to a grind spec. And so what you're seeing is less and less and less grinding. You're typically seeing grinding only when, like, clutch plates that we talked about, or in something that... Um, a shaft needs no lead on it. So it needs to have no lead on it, meaning it has a seal or something on it. So if you turn a shaft and it's gonna have a seal that's on it, you will guarantee have a oil leak from it. Because when you turn it, you turn a spiral into it, right? But when you, and then what happens is you have pressure that builds up and then that oil will start to work itself out of that spiral and it will start to work itself out of that seal. So when they grind, like over Garden Denver, um, their grinding wheels are like, it's over their OD grinding, They're about this wide, and then the shaft comes out, and they go, ch, 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 all the way down the shaft, and makes it perfect, perfect, no, no steps in it, nothing, but by doing that, by plunging into it, you're not creating spiral, because you're going into it and not moving, it's coming out. Stepping over, going into it, not moving. So they have an air seal on a lot of their parts. So, like, if you were to take one of their compressors and fill it full of air, air and oil would come out the ends of those things. But what the what the way they control the pressure on it is the machine builds up pressure. The centrifugal force holds the oil into it so that they don't have a rubber seal wearing on that shaft. So it's pretty slick, pretty slick design. Makes these last a lot longer. So there's OD grinding.
Here's a OD grinder setup between centers. Now the thing about these centers on this thing, um, so lathe chuck has a center called a what? What kind of center is it? Live center. Live center. Grinder like this has what's called a dead center. And what they mean is they do not spin. So both of them stay completely stable in there. And you use something like, um, you use some kind of a, a center lubricant. Uh, center Saver is one of the brands that you use. And it's kind of, it kind of looks like, uh, you ever use ANSYS? And once you use ANSYS, you, 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 you never actually quit using it because it always stays on you forever. So um, it's like ANSYS and it lubricates that center as it goes, but it does not rotate because usually when you're doing diameters like that, the ball bearing run out in it is too much. So it's got to be that perfect. So like when we would grind shafts, um, we could grind, I think, three foot probably on our OD grinder. Um, and so we would grind shafts with less than a tenth run out, total run out in any kind of faces or diameters within the entire spec. Um, and you couldn't have, I mean, your ball bearings had a little bit of, or your needle bearings had a little bit of run out in them or, you know, clearance in there. And so that wasn't good enough. So they've got a drive dog set up. Um, this is just some parts of the shaft. Then they got, they're going to OD grind this and then probably flip it around and OD grind this would be my suspicion. But there's a lot of old, old, I mean, there's a ton of brand new OD grinders out there too. We had an Akuma. OD grinder, OD ID grinder, that was like from the 40s. I mean, this thing, it it looked like, it looked like some kind of suicide death trap device, you know. But it, I mean, it was it was awesome. I'd never so actually we had some people come from Akuma to tour our shop one time, and they were like, "Hey, what are y'all gonna do with that grinder?" And they're like, "We're using it." They're like, "If you ever want to get rid of it, we'll take it to our Akuma museum." I was like, I don't know what that says, that your machines are so old they could go into the Akuma Museum, which they had one already that was very similar to it. I think they probably wanted it for parts. We actually, these things are so sensitive that we took it up to KC Machine to have some work done to it, and the jiggling of it on the way up there knocked it so far out of tolerance that they said we can't even fix it. I was like, that sucks because it did work. And they were like, Sorry, it was probably on its last leg, and, and apparently it was. A lot of times you'll magnetic chuck on the grinder. Super slick. I wish we could magnetic chuck mm -hmm. everything, right? Yeah. So magnetic chuck is just like the grinding uh, vise or grinding plate. You just turn it on, turn it off. And um, and so since you're not putting heavy pressure on it, it's no big deal, you know? So you get your part in there, you can indicate it in. You can turn that bag on a little bit, get it indicated in, and then um, grind the OD, grind the ID, grind the faces of it, whatever. Here's an ID grinding attachment. So a lot of them are really small. Some of them are huge though, so it doesn't have to doesn't have to be tiny like that. A lot of shops are actually grinding shops. So you, you know, I think it's pretty uncommon to see shops that do a lot of grinding, milling, and turning, other than surface grinding. So like Waterloo, Seattle, Black Decker, they do a, a ton of surface grinding. Uh, not very many shops do a lot of ODID grinding because it's pretty, it's pretty crazy to do and it takes a pretty big machine. You might know what this kind of grinding is called. 200 real bonus points if you know what this is called. Without looking, centerless grinding. Here's what's so cool about this. In my mind, this doesn't even seem like it works. So you put a shaft in here. So you got a shaft that can't have any centers on it, or it's really thin, like a dowel pin. So a dowel pin doesn't have centers on it, right? But the OD's on a, the OD's, the OD's ground. So they put this in here, two grinding wheels. They've got a rest that holds it level. You put the shaft, pin, whatever it is in there. Both the wheels are spinning, and it grinds. It, and then the part's just loose in there. And just by it grinding like this, it, it spins it and grinds it down to size. And so, but it doesn't need, it's, it's really not attached in there at all. Like at any moment, you could just go, you know, I wouldn't, but it's super cool. Like if you have something like a dowel pin that doesn't, it has no ability to have any kind of centers or it's so small, you can't get in there, then something like this is the way to go. So, um, the wheels are all the 
the distance between the wheels is all that really matters? Yeah, and the distance between wheels, so like typically, well, not typically, but one, some of them, one wheel is fixed, never moves. The other wheel moving in and out determines the diameter of it that it grinds it to. Right, so like, so say maybe this is on the far side and this one doesn't, this one doesn't move, it just spins. You set your work rest and however it might happen to be, not all of them will look quite like this, but most of them. You put, you bring your other wheel, your regulating wheel in, and you, you bring it down and, and it's pushing it or pulling it out and it's, it's determining where, where the size of it's going to be. The longer it sits in there also, the more it's going to grind off of it. So, um, slick though. Okay, here is a uh, little rotary grinding setup. Um, so this one might be a little hard. I know it's in your book too. So this is similar. So a lot of times we call it the jig board. And um, so it is non-programmable. They have programmable models of them. But it is basically a super tight bridge board or a mill that just grinds a singular hole, okay? So you might set it up, it's oscillating, so it's spinning and, you know, running in a circle. And you might do, so like where this really started, big guys that needed the posts ground, you would come in and set it up for, you would indicate it in, do a singular post hole, move it over, to a singular post hole, move it over four times, or if you have like a punch and die clearance, that's gotta be super tight, so like if you're punching paper, like the tolerances are tenths, like two or three tenths tolerance and clearance. So a tenth tolerance and three tenths clearance or two tenths, two microns tolerance and three tenths clearance because paper's so thin, but it's super abrasive. And so um, you would grind these in so that the pin, the punch and the die would, would go together and, and do the work that they need to do. So uh, it's movable X and Y. See, they've got this uh, cover on it, and that's to keep the uh, grinding abrasive from just destroying the lead screws and stuff on it. Okay, um, that's one. There's a quiz on that. I'm going to move on to the other one. And so I put all this in there, and you're welcome to look at all these. Can't go to sleep tonight. You can look at, just look at grinding pictures. Okay. Second one we're going to talk about is wheels. Which wheels are right? Which, how, to, how to take care of the wheel, what you're supposed to do with the wheel. Um, so typically what we use is, is just a straight wheel like this. Most people, that's, that's probably what they're using, uh, I think, most of the time. Um, so... These dish wheels or flaring cup wheels. So flaring cup wheel, anybody know what it, one of those might be used for? Grinding end mills, grinding tools. So they have those, you know, they, they have to be able to get in the spiral on that. And um, so sometimes you'll see them like that. Sometimes you're going to see some shaped wheels just because they grind shapes, right? Like so, so since the, since the grinding wheel can't really, it's not an end mill and it can't interpolate different things. You're going to grind that radius or shape on there. Tomorrow I'll bring in um, one of our radius dressers for the grinding wheels. And you can actually grind these shapes on there. You can actually make any of our wheels into some of these. I don't want to say all of them. Some of them will be undercut, have some taper on them, some recessed areas on there. The more recessing that you have on the front, the easier it is to face grind something. Um, you're trying to get a less amount of contact area on there. You get a whole bunch of contact area on there, and it starts to, it, it, it can, even a grinder can chatter. Um, but you get grinder chatter, you can get uh, some kind of burn spots on the, on the faces, or it can really just load the wheel up pretty heavily. So uh, a lot of times they're going to be recessed in there just to avoid some of that uh, contact area. There's a couple of different ID mandrels. I mean, some of these are really simple, like what would be on a Dremel. You ever seen anybody run a Dremel on a tool post? Yeah. I mean, I've done it. Yeah. 
And so when did you see me doing it? You were grinding jaws. Grinding jaws. Jaws are hard. So we would preload the jaws to a certain diameter. We bought a Dremel, a big old, well, it's an air die grinder is really what it is. And we bought some of these and we dressed them up, ran them in there, reground those jaws. Because what happens is students, um, they either kind of swell out those jaws or part spin. Anybody ever have part spin in the jaws here on a part? Yeah, some of y'all. Um, and so they get spun in there, and then um, it, it just doesn't it doesn't indicate or it doesn't set in there as true. So I came through and I redid several of them. They all need to be redone before we move them again. But um, set them up and just rewent and just redid the IDs on them. So so you have a, a mandrel that you just put these on, um, or they have a um, some type of cemented, glued, epoxied mandrel that goes on them. So here's just a couple different kinds of wheels, just other than a drawing. Okay, this is where I think it probably gets pretty important. When you're looking at the wheels that you have, So every one of these wheels has some type of numbering system on there that may look uh, very similar to that, uh, may have some variation from, from what you have. But very similar to like an insert, it's going to have some type of number, numbering system, uh, whether just so you know what grinding wheel that you're using, what application that you're using it for, how to reorder it so that you know that you have that same one the next time. Um, and so it goes anywhere from the abrasive type. So when we're doing our NIMS testing, um, if, I, if I've noticed a trend in the questions, probably the biggest question is on the types of abrasives, okay? There's really only a couple types of abrasives that we're going to use, sorry. Um, aluminum oxide, silicon carbide. And so aluminum oxide is typically what we're grinding with. That's most, what most of our grinding is. Then there's a coarseness of um, coarse, medium, or fine. So the more, the higher the number, the finer it is. Okay, so similar to sandpaper. Because, I mean, essentially, that's what you got. Sandpaper in a wheel form, right? And it's, it's just going to do this job. So, yeah, fish got it so very fine. Then you have a grade of soft, medium, and hard. And so what would you, let's just say you're grinding... Um, hard stuff, do you want like 58 Rockwell stuff? Do you want a wheel that's hard or do you want a wheel that's soft? Or what's the advantages of a wheel that's hard and a wheel that's soft? Support Rockwell. 58. Let's just say we're grinding something that's 58 Rockwell. Yeah, so we would want a wheel that is somewhat hard, right? Because the softer the wheel, the quicker it's going to break down. And so we want a wheel that kind of matches along with that. So even if you go, so like in your mind, you might go, well, I'm not going to grind off very much off of this thing. Um, and I want a super good finish. And so I might go to 600 grit. And you would think, okay, so it's a super fine wheel. It's going to give me a really great finish. That's probably true. If that wheel is super soft, you will find yourself with an exorbitant amount of tapering and loading because the wheel is so soft. And so it's about finding that common ground or happy medium or what your shop has. Like you might usually grind soft stuff and then suddenly you get a hard job that you got to grind and then you got to make do with what you got or the other way could be. So it depends on what's going on. Um, and then so your structure, you've got either wide spaced grains or closely grouped grain spacing. So that's that's the ability to have something load up. Okay, so like you guys are grinding the aluminum right now, or some of you guys are grinding the aluminum, and you're finding that it loads very quickly. So what you want to you want to have, you don't care about hardness or softness of wheel because the material is super, super soft. But the finer the wheel is, the faster it loads up. The closer the grain structure is, the faster it loads up. So if you want success grinding across that big surface area, 
you want as coarse as you can. You aren't really concerned about hard or soft. I mean, hard's, hard, hard's probably better. But you want something that you want it to look as porous as possible to get your material off. Okay. Now, if we were running, your best operation to get good grinding done for aluminum is to have a good flow coolant. We don't have coolant on our grinder. I mean, honestly, if there there is no worse grinder setup than what we have right now. Grinding aluminum sucks. Grinding with no coolant sucks. Um, and not having automatic grinding and dressing sucks. But almost every 104 student that I've had that has gone through this and dressed uh, or had have ground aluminum, every every 104 grind aluminum. And they've said, man, that really sucked. Um, when I started, when I went to the shop that I went to, um, we never ground aluminum, but I definitely knew how to grind really soft stuff because we I struggled through the grinding of that aluminum. And so when we came to some stuff like some cold rolled steel, um, or hot rolled steel. He's like, I knew how to grind that well because we had to we had to fight through grinding that aluminum. Grinding aluminum sucks, man. So we had a we had a big rotary grinder. We used to grind a bunch of aluminum. So um, we we used to make sprint car starters, and um, you know they had they just got the shaft and the handles, and you know just jack it up with the wheel. And um, so we we built these big old giant things, well they're not big giant things, but pretty good size. And so these plates, the guy who we were making them for our four, he wanted this rotary ground look. And we we're like, ah man, we typically don't grind aluminum. And he's like, that's what I want. Super, super particular. Um, you know Steve Smith from Smith Science and Study? He did, it was him. And so he wanted that spiraling pattern on this, on the face of the part. So he built a jig, ground them, and I mean, we were dressing this dress this wheel all the time for it. We were only taking off about three thousandths, but I mean, our wheel was this big around, and we had this giant flood of coolant. And our guys just complained all the time. They're like, "We are dressing this thing all the time." I was like, "You're right, and you will appreciate every other thing that you grind from now on." And they were like, "That doesn't make it any better. We still hate this." And I was like, "I don't think that's the job." All right, um, and so bonding type. Um, how, how it's held together, that matters, you know? I mean, because it, it actually becomes part of the wheel, right? So if you've got some type of bond that's really uh, heavy or hard, it can, it can affect your material. And so, I mean, for us, um, and then this would just be a custom one for the manufacturer. Um, for us, we stay in a zone, a two, a one, um, somewhere in the 50s, Rockwell range. Um, so we're, we're in a pretty, pretty common zone. Um, so your 60 grit wheel um, is 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 pretty standard wheel to use. Um, you can go up a little bit higher. We got I think we got some 120s, but other than that, um, it's pretty pretty standard. And you'll see that that most of your shops are going to have kind of a, a standard two or three kinds of wheel that they use. Um, Lee, at your shop, do you guys use just a certain kind of end mills, or do you have like do you find yourself always using kind of um, three-quarter floor fluid end mills or a certain kinds of taps or do you, you tap certain holes a lot? Yeah, I mean, I mean everything we do is rather similar. We don't right. vary very much. Yeah, it's all carbide end mills, and yeah. floor fluid. Yeah, and so that's how, that's how our shop was too. We had, you kind of knew the end mill families that you were going to go into. You knew the types of taps that you were going to use. Um, if it's a tooling taps, you were using these kinds. If you were in a production setup, you are using the goo ring, undercut, production style taps, a little bit different. And so same thing with grinding, is you're going to find yourself in a zone of grinding. And um, so here is um, just another grinding wheel. This one's cupped. Um, here's a little, inform a little more information about the grinding wheel. Um, with the wheel, diameter of the wheel, hole size. Hole size is pretty important. You don't want to go by order a bunch of grinding wheels um, and um, have have it be the wrong hole size. Like there's the, there's no boring out those things. I mean you could, but you, you would you would probably rather not. Okay, so um, here's just a little bit more, same types of stuff. Okay, so what I want to talk about is, is um, just a couple things that we'll talk about more on them in the 
future for the next time that we meet. A couple things that are really important to the grinding wheel that we haven't talked about is the balance of the grinding wheel and the blotters on the grinding wheel. The blotter is what houses all the information to your grinding wheel. You can never, ever, 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 ever mount a grinding wheel like this. Like you can buy just blotters um, and uh, I tore these off of it just so we would have one that didn't have it on there. So this is a pretty thin grinding wheel, it's a nice wheel. Um, but you've got to have these on there. You cannot mount these plates to this thing without some type of paper in between it. It just won't stick. Okay. Um, and then all of these screws are what handed? Left handed. Right. So, and it's very, I mean, we're right handed in everything that we do. And so it's very, very easy to be like trying to hammer this thing off. And you're just tightening it and tightening it and tightening it and tightening it. And so if you do that, you also want to check the wheel. If you've tightened it for 20 minutes and you feel like you got a full revolution and you're like, yikes, I think I'm going the wrong way. You want to check that wheel for cracks. Because just like what the story I told you guys before, um, whether the wheel is loaded up with coolant or not, if it has a crack or a fracture in it, it will freaking explode. And it will go everywhere because it breaks into such small pieces. And the volume here that you have wheel, um, it's going to go everywhere. So like an end mill when it breaks, I mean, it's like, you know, it kind of falls there. Every once in a while you'll hear a ping, you know, shoot off. This thing, size-wise, is like 100 times an end mill. I mean, it's like a grenade, man. So, hey, fun fact, did you know that when grenades first came out, you know what the exact, that they were modeled off of? Baseball. Isn't that awesome? Because every American knew how to throw a baseball. Every American knew how to throw a baseball. Isn't that crazy? I love little facts like that. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's cool. I was I should be a for that. All right. So, so another thing that we haven't talked about, but we will talk about, we haven't really used it because our wheels have been pretty true on the on the grinders. If you're using a wheel, especially like a CDN wheel or something like that, that doesn't really get dressed out, like, like these wheels are easy to dress out. So you can pretty much throw one of these on the grinder, dress out 10 thousandths of it and go on. But imagine you have a wheel that is a true running wheel or um, only has the very outside of it as the grinding area. So maybe, maybe the grinding area is only 30 thousandths thick it, and the rest of it does not grind. So CBN, cubic boron nitrite, is one of the ones I'm talking about. If you were to put that on there, that wheel has to spin almost true to start. Okay, So you can use a wheel balancer like this. And what you do is you loosen this thing up, remember left hand threads, and you move the wheel around here. So you'll level this up in, in all the directions. And the idea is that as it spins on there, it should come to a point where it doesn't see how it goes back down. So something about it is unbalanced. It's either probably probably a combo. It's probably running down the hill, probably over, and some shifted in some other way. But you want to be able to spin this thing and have it not always go. And when you pick it back up, it does go. Because like you take a wheel like that, like a CBN wheel. So like you have a 12 inch CBN wheel that's two inches wide that you're going to drive really really hard stuff with. That's probably an eight thousand dollar wheel. So there, and, and there's really not much material on the outside of it that grinds, and cluster diamond is the only way that you're going to dress it. So like, like you don't want to come up to it, dress off thirty thousands of it, and then go to your boss and be like, "Hey, that CBN wheel, it all the CBN's gone off of it." Because like we had one, um, we bought it used. It was probably twenty years old when we bought it. And we used it for 20 years. And it probably had another 20 years on it. So, I mean, it was just, like, they just don't wear out that much, you know. I mean, for the amount of grindings that we were grinding. I mean, I'm sure somebody's grinding them that, that goes through them faster. So, uh, but we were not. All right, one other thing. Um, so, sometimes you'll see uh, this grinding wheel. It's not really a OD grinding wheel. This is a bench grinder grinding wheel. But sometimes you'll see little spacers like this put in them. Um, it's totally fine to spacer or bushing these things out like that. So like, don't, don't fear that, but I would just make sure you're using something good and solid. What you want is that you want that wheel, the face, the stoppers on that wheel to really grab tight on the water. 
uh, to hold good on the surfaces of it, make sure that you're, you've got something really good and strong going. Whenever I start a wheel, I always toggle it. So on off, on off, on off, on off, on off. You know, don't want to get it going, you know? Because if I just hit it and then I'm like, oh my gosh, like there's no way that I can do anything with it. But if I can kind of work it up RPM wise, because there is no, there is no RPM options. Once the wheels either off or on, so I want to kind of toggle it just by off and on so that I can see if i got a problem. If I didn't get it tight or i got some type of crack problem, I want to see those problems really, really fast. A lot of times when you have a crack in a wheel, um, if I had something, I would, I would do it. But you can tap them, and they will ring, so you can get a ring test, and they'll make a noise when it's got a crack. I might try to take and crack one without breaking it so that you guys will have an example to go off of. You'll hear it. It's a definitely a different sound from a cracked wheel or a non-cracked wheel. But ringing the wheel, yeah. Yeah, so so that should sound like that, right? Like, that sounds right. When it's got a crack in it, it's like, thump, why? Yeah, because it doesn't, it's just, it, the harmonics don't work anymore. Okay. So, all right, so that is section seven grinding unit one and two. It's just really the slides in your book. And then the questions are based upon the, the information in the book. Everything that we're going to on that test is based upon this book, the stuff I'm talking about, and then the stuff that we'll be looking at in the men's practice test. If there is a thing that you guys are probably most unfamiliar with, it is grinding. Um, you know, I think I, I would turn you guys loose on any type of CNC milling, turning, manual milling or turning and feel very confident that you would do well. This is one that, like, I don't really think the questions are hard, but I think the questions are ones where they're like, oh, gosh, um, could be this, could be that, I don't quite remember, but you don't have a reference or resource to do it. So I think next time when we're in class, which hopefully will be tomorrow, should be tomorrow, um, I want you guys to have your machine or handbooks available as well. Um, so have your textbook, machine, machine or handbook, because uh, you can have the machine or handbook with you. And so it's got a pretty extensive grinding wheel section in there. Okay, questions? If you are smart, you'll go ahead and just do these two question sets now. You do not have to do them now, but we're covering it. It's fresh in your mind, and so you'll have a better opportunity for that. Okay, can you put your grinding wheels up there on that bench, please? Thank you. Thank you.